Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. We are privileged to hear and have Dr. Mark Bailey as our chapel speaker today. He serves as president of Dallas Theological Seminary and professor of Bible exposition. His love for people and passion for the truth provide a unique leadership perspective for both the church and classroom. Please welcome Dr. Mark Bailey. Good morning. I hope that you are uh, enjoying your classes and that God is uh, changing your life, uh, your heart, uh, by his word and by his spirit as you interact uh, together as a class uh, among peers, as well as having been instructed by what I consider the finest faculty in the world, but I'm prejudiced, as you know. And so it's a privilege to be with you on this, our last chapel. I want to take a few minutes and talk to you about your number one sin. And uh, it sounds a little audacious of me to tell you I know about it. It's because it's the number one uh, sin in the history of Israel. It was the number one sin in the experience of Christ and his disciples uh, in working with them. It was their number one sin. And it's yours and my number one sin. Uh, it's not the sin of lust. It's not the sin of anger. It's not the sin of ambition. It's not the sin of covetousness. It's not the sin even of idolatry, though all of those are the out flow of uh, this, your number one and my number one sin. Uh, I want to speak to it from a passage in Luke chapter uh, 7, if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Uh, the parallel passage is in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. Uh, Luke chapter 7, and if you want to put a finger in Matthew 8, we'll make a final reference to that toward the end. But Luke chapter 7, verses 1 and following, uh, when he had completed all his discourse, and in Luke's account, uh, this follows what many have called the Sermon on the Plain, which may be the Sermon on the Level Place of the Mountain, on which the Sermon on the Mount was given when you compare the Gospels. In terms of placement, uh, Matthew has one small little pericope or passage that intersects between the Sermon on the Mount and this account in Matthew chapter 8. Uh, but Luke immediately follows the teaching of Jesus with this account of the healing of the centurion's servant. And I, I call it the miracle of the centurion checkers. Uh, or if I could put it in another phrase, it's the faith of the I too, uh, spelled T-O-O. When he had completed all of his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum, probably from that uh, north shore line of the Sea of Galilee, just down to the little waterfront village of Capernaum. And, and a certain centurion slave who uh, was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. There is a centurion who had a servant whom he deeply loved, but he was sick and about to die. Matthew says he was lying paralyzed at home, and an interesting uh, conjunction of concepts. He was paralyzed, but suffering great pain, not paralyzed enough not to feel the pain. That's a bit of a mystery. You remember when Johnny Erickson Tata was on our campus this spring, she, having become a quadriplegic because of her diving accident, was all of a sudden starting to have pain in her back this year that was inexplicable. Uh, it can happen, and evidently it happened here as well. And in Luke's account, it says in verse 3 that when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and to, and here's a great phrase in Luke's gospel, save the life of his slave. And when uh, they had come to Jesus, they earnestly entreated him, saying, he is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built our synagogue. Now, if you go with us to Israel on one of our treks, we would take you to the city of Capernaum there on the northwest uh, corner of the Sea of Galilee, and we would show you the, one of the greatest uh, remains of a synagogue uh, that we have. This one is a third or fourth century limestone synagogue, but built over the floor of a basalt, a black volcanic basalt rock uh, uh, synagogue that was uh, present in Jesus' day. Uh, the reason why these Jewish elders were willing to intercede for a Roman centurion is because he, he loves our nation 
And uh, he's worthy because he helped build our synagogue. Uh, Anytime you get a Roman centurion building a Jewish synagogue, you know that there's uh, been some good civil relationships developed somewhere. And so they intercede. He asks them to intercede. They intercede. And notice the phrase, from their perspective, he's worthy. He's worthy because he loves us and he built our house of worship. Now that's the, uh, that's the intercession on the part of these friends. Now Jesus started on his way with them and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent some friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy uh, to come to you. It's interesting that in Matthew's gospel, in verse seven, it says, I will come and heal him. That's Jesus' intent. That's on the table. We already know that. And Matthew telescopes inwardly just to get you to the conversations where Luke gives us more of the detail. Now, it's at this point that I want to stop because we, we see the, the view of his friends, but we see the view of the centurion. Uh, the faith of the centurion is demonstrated, first of all, in his humility, in the way he views himself. He views himself as unworthy while they viewed him as worthy. He views himself as unworthy because I'm not worthy for Jesus to come to me, he says, and I'm not worthy even to approach Jesus. He uh, has an understanding of the greatness of Jesus and the uh, less than greatness of himself. He's he's not worthy of the presence of Jesus, and he's not worthy even to approach Jesus. He has nothing to bring to the table. We see that poverty of spirit that Jesus extols in other contexts, but his humility is noteworthy. I'm, I'm not worthy. Now, the way he expresses this is in a fascinating uh, picture because he not only understands his own humility, he understands who Jesus is. Now, there's some ways in which he is not like Jesus, but what he's going to express is there is a way in which he is like Jesus. I want you to see this. A a Kilurian was one who was in charge of a thousand soldiers. A centurion is one who's in charge of a hundred soldiers, and a decorian is one who is in charge of other servants or soldiers. And so the centurion finds himself in a position of loyalty to his leadership and also in leadership of those who follow him. And in this context, his servants who are doing his bidding, those who have come on his behalf. He sends servants out to say, don't come any further. Don't bother me. Don't, don't, don't approach me any further. I'm not worthy for you to be here. I don't even deserve for you to be under my roof. And I don't deserve to be under yours. And then he says this, for I too am a man under authority. And he says, and I say, go and they go, come and they come, do this and they do this. Now, did you catch what he says? I am under authority and I am in authority. It's one of my favorite miracles because he says, I too, I also. And what he's expressing is an understanding of Jesus that we're going to find is incredibly insightful. Because what he's saying is, I'm under authority and so are you. I'm in authority and so are you. My authority is relative because I have Calurians above me and I have Decurians or servants beneath me, but I recognize that you also are under authority. But he's saying, I also recognize that you're in authority. And I'm not worthy for you to be here. And I'm not worthy for me to come to you. It is a phenomenal statement of his faith because he understands that Christ is under the authority of his Father, and he understands that Christ is in authority as well. So much so that Jesus only has, and the phrase that he uses here, speak a word. Just speak a word. 
You don't have to come any farther. Just speak a word and my servant will be healed. What incredible confidence this Roman centurion has in the authority of Christ and his word. He has the authority over people. He has the authority over nature. He has the authority over disease. And both Matthew and Luke have been logging in uh, numerous miracles to demonstrate that fact. But now watch this. The centurion puts himself under the authority of Christ. I love that. Let me do that again. The centurion, I had fun with this. The centurion puts himself under the authority of Christ and says, I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy of it. But if all you will do is speak a word, my servant would be healed. Look at the text with me for a moment. Luke chapter 7, verse 8. For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to the one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. Do this, and he does this. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him. And he turned and he said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, which is one of Luke's favorite introductions of a profound statement of theological significance by our Lord, I say to you that even in Israel, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. In Matthew's context, it's more graphic. Listen to what he says. Truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. This centurion has outstripped them all. And in Matthew's gospel, he says, And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west to recline at a table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, those that should have been there, will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he said to the centurion, go your way, let it be to you as you have believed. And the servant was healed, according to Matthew's gospel, that very hour in Luke's gospel. And when those who had, had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. The number one sin in the history of Israel was a lack of this kind of faith. The number one sin for which Jesus rebuked his disciples throughout the gospels it was not inordinate affection. It was not ambition. It, it, it was not lust. It was not greed. It was, oh, you of little faith. Because faith is that aspect in which we trust what Christ says. The centurion gets it. Israel missed it. I haven't found this kind of faith in all Israel, not in the disciples, not in the Jewish leaders, not in the people in general. I've not found this kind of faith with anybody in Israel, including the disciples. It's your number one sin, and it's my number one sin. It's the number one sin of the world. It's the number one sin of the nation of Israel, which in the historic context was their failure to believe that God the Father had sent God the Son, who was his beloved Son, to whom they were to listen and to whom they were to respond in faith. The little lesson of the checkers is that the centurion put himself under the authority of Christ, who he recognized was under the authority of his Father. And hence, he found his rightful place under the leadership of God himself and his Son, Jesus. The application is obvious. That's where you and I should find ourselves. Is absolutely trusting God who sent his son. And God has made in the person of his son the only provision for our life and ministry. Peter picked it up finally when he says, God has given to us everything necessary for life and godliness. So let me give you a definition of faith this morning. Faith is trusting the message about Christ who as a person has the power to provide all that we need for life in him. Jesus said, without me you can do, say it, nothing. Zippo, that's Greek. No, it's not. Without me you can do nothing. 
Most of us, including myself, live our lives that without him, I can't do the really big things. But Jesus would say, and if I have faith, I'll trust Jesus, who said, without him, I can do nothing. See, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to him must first believe that he actually exists, that he is the I am that I am, as he revealed himself to Moses, the one who really is God. And then Colossians gives us a little clue. In the same way you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. It's not a mystery, but how often we forget. The same way we came to Christ is the same way we live for Christ. And that is what? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. It's critical for our salvation. It's critical for our life and ministry as well. Do you really believe that God in Christ has provided everything you need for life, including your studies, your ministry, your family? It's our number one sin, just not to trust. But the centurion, who understood he wasn't worthy of the presence of Christ, neither are we. He wasn't worthy to approach Christ, neither are we. Nevertheless, demonstrates a faith that Jesus said, oh. The word that is used here is fascinating. It's only used twice in the Gospels. Jesus marveled at him. There's only two times in all of the Gospels where Jesus marveled. Once is here. For the faith of a Gentile who gets it. The other time, ironically, was in Nazareth with the Jews and his hometown and his home family who didn't get it. Jesus marvels at unbelief. Jesus marvels at belief. With which would you like to surprise him today? Father, may we be the source of your marvel for our faith, not for our unbelief. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.